This next section will focus on sex trafficking in Canada. A form of sexual exploitation, sex trafficking refers to the forced, coercive, fraudulent, or deceptive exchange of sex for something of value. For example, money, food, drugs, alcohol, transportation, or shelter. This can include sexual exploitation online, including social media platforms, through sexual imagery or video. Now you might be more familiar with the concept of pimping and simply put, sex trafficking is another term for pimping. Typologies of sex trafficking can include escorting, illicit massage, forced pornography, forced camming, as well as forced stripping. Children and youth under the age of 18 cannot engage in sex work or cannot exchange sex for money, drugs, alcohol, transportation, etc., or any other object of necessity. Traffickers are extremely skilled at presenting themselves as potential protectors, as potential partners or potential providers, which may sometimes feel like the perfect solution to what's going on in someone's life. So let's talk about how sex trafficking is typically happening in Canada. For the purpose of this slide, we're going to consider the potential targeted individual or victim to be female and the trafficker we will refer to as male. The most common scenario we see is the boyfriend trafficker, also known as the Romeo pimp. Unfortunately, there is a bit of a formula that accompanies this type of trafficking, um, and it is incredibly effective and easily replicated. On this slide, you will see the typical stages of grooming um, and exploitation. On the far left side is the luring stage, where traffickers are really looking to identify young people who have more obvious signs of being at risk. First contact is likely to be on social media, and then from there, the relationship is built. In the grooming and gaming stage, traffickers might be love bombing someone with, um, you know, the intention of compiling information about them. This will look like asking them lots of questions, paying special attention to them, maybe special gifts or taking them out on dates. And really in this stage, the traffickers are trying to find out what's missing in that person's life and trying to fill that need. For example, is this a runaway youth who needs shelter or maybe a place to belong? And by providing that or fulfilling that need, the trafficker is trying to ensure that the victim is dependent on them. As the relationship develops, the trafficker may slowly start to alienate the victim away from their community of supports, family, and trusted persons. During the manipulation and coercion stage, the, um, the trafficker may use the tactics of force, threats, violence, and deception. Here, the trafficker may also start to be hot and cold, which really is intentional to keep the victim on edge and keep them more willing to do whatever they can to keep the relationship in that honeymoon phase. Then at some point, the trafficker will ask the victim to do sexual things, either with them or with others or both. Um, and maybe they'll be asked to do sexual things to repay the money that's been spent on them. Perhaps it's even propositioned as a way for the couple to maintain their new lifestyle or earn money together for their future. The trafficker might also tell the victim that something bad will happen to them if they don't do what the trafficker wants. Once the victim has engaged in that first sex act, these steps are now complete and the trafficker can continue to use threats and violence to keep that person compliant. As I mentioned earlier when we discussed risk factors, simply belonging to certain cultural groups can make someone more at risk for being targeted by traffickers. And this is especially true for Indigenous women, girls, and two-spirit persons. Canada has a long history of ex exploiting Indigenous women and girls dating back to early European colonization. This history and its ongoing legacy is still well hidden in Canada. Pre-contact with European settlers, Indigenous communities regard, were regarded as gender fluid and non-binary, and European concepts of gender norms and power dynamics simply didn't exist. Historically, slavery was one of the ways that the value and use of Indigenous peoples was predetermined by white male settlers. The Native Women's Association of Canada states that historically, Indigenous women have been positioned as inherently less valuable and more available than non-Indigenous, non-racialized bodies. The violence experienced by women who are exploited, who are trafficked, or who identify as sex workers is not separate from colonial violence, but truly a central part of colonial violence. And again, as a result of ongoing colonialism and discrimination, Indigenous women and girls have less access to social supports and services, which puts them at a greater risk for being trafficked. 
Indigenous women and girls experience strong racial and institutional racism prior to being trafficked, and victims often come from places of oppression, systemic discrimination, and poverty. <clears throat> There is no denying the intersection between the epidemic of missing and murdered Indigenous women, girls, and two spirit persons, and human trafficking. Some of the reoccurring themes that expose Indigenous women and girls to traffickers and facilitates their recruitment into trafficking include precarious housing and substandard living conditions, higher rates of unemployment, lack of access to social and economic resources, prior exposure to human trafficking, family violence and the impacts of colonization, residential school experiences and intergenerational trauma, as well as an involvement in the child welfare systems as well as the criminal justice system. Increasingly, anti-trafficking advocates and allies are actively working to challenge the existing frameworks and dominant colonial narratives that seek to erase Indigenous peoples, that mislabel them as minorities and portray the exploitation of Indigenous women, girls, and gender diverse people through a lens of criminalization. Now we're gonna talk about some general indicators of sex trafficking. And it's really important to note that every survivor is unique and each situation of trafficking is unique. So a one size fits all approach to understanding these indicators is not helpful. Instead, we recommend that you consider a number of these indicators, but also keep in mind the general context of the situation and patterns of behavior in mind as well. Human trafficking is complex. These signs and indicators are often overlapping and nuanced. And again, indicators alone are not enough to identify trafficking. We really wanna be mindful that indicators can alone can increase policing and surveillance of other at-risk groups such as um, migrant sex workers. So unexplained withdrawal or absence from friends, family and activities, sudden changes in appearance, including clothing, accessories, makeup, nails, Providing scripted or rehearsed answers to casual questions, secretive behavior about a new friend group or partner, expressing fear and intimidation through facial expressions or body language, branding with tattoos of the trafficker's name or symbol, frequent absences from home, school, or work, visible signs of abuse, so cuts, burns, bruises, fatigue, um, substance use as well, not having passport, other forms of ID, potentially they're being controlled, um, someone else might be speaking on their behalf. So while under the control and direction of a trafficker, a victim may be told when they can eat, when they can sleep, who they can talk to, what clients to see, how many, and what sexual acts to perform. The trafficker may use necessities like substances, blackmail, lies, and violence to keep the victim compliant. The trafficker may force a victim to commit crimes such as theft, drug trafficking, recruitment of other young victims as a means of control. And we know that traffickers may take out loans and credit instruments in the victim's name, again, using financial abuse as a means of control. Finally, we know that human trafficking in Canada is happening at alarming rates, but unfortunately it still remains a crime that is often hidden in plain sight. And there are a number of overlapping factors at play here. For example, a victim may have a trauma bond with their trafficker. Like we talked about, they may be in an intimate or familial relationship with that person and feel a sense of duty, loyalty, and love. Traffickers are often lying and manipulating victims into believing that they're going to get in trouble if they seek help or that no one will love them if they come forward. So there's a lot of stigma that's associated with sex trafficking. Victims are often coached by traffickers to lie and give rehearsed answers to concerned family members, support workers, and police, so as not to raise suspicion. Again, it's really important when we think about that trauma bond, the trafficker might be the only person who has ever shown them genuine attention, love, or support, and that's a really tough bond to break. The exploitation and trafficking can be really nuanced. And we know that many victims don't even understand that what's happening to them is a crime and they certainly don't have the language to, to label what's happening to them. Traffickers are frequently moving victims from place to place. Oftentimes they don't know how or where to get help. Finally, we talked about the distrust of institutions such as police and social service providers as well as child protection agencies, um, especially for communities of color, make people reluctant to self-report and self-identify as being trafficked. <clears throat>